to stabilize itself and eventually to thrive and to become a world power, by which once that occurred, Umar ibn al-Khattab, an, he actually said, we don't do this anymore. So he actually said that we are not going to pay other tribes and other people because we only did this at a time of weakness to establish ourselves and now we don't. Now, that being said, I think what's interesting about this, so the, the Madahib would often, you know, of course, when they were established, right, the state was very strong, right? For the most part, you know, Islam was a power. Uh, they generally followed that rule that they would not, not just give it to people whose hearts were to be inclined. I think today it becomes tricky again, because number one is Islam is incredibly weak. So people's hearts are in need of being turned towards Islam, but we also don't have a state. So this can be a very a tricky situation where someone can abuse this. And so I see these circumstances where people want to give exorbitant sums, sums of money to politicians, you know, in order to, to win over their hearts. And I think this is a, a, a very uh, contentious issue that may not be, uh, you know, <laughs> number one is that there's no clear indicator this is actually going to have any effect, right? And, and number two, it's operating outside of any sort of like a, of a governmental conf, you know, there's no confines of this, right? Who is determining you know, where the maslaha is, right? It's just random people, you know, who often may have no idea what's actually in the benefit of the ummah. But people today think about this in other ways that, for instance, let's say you have new converts and those people who convert to Islam know that by me converting, I will lose, for instance, parental support, right? And they fear for, you know, their financial well-being. So there's opinions that say in these circumstances, that it could be used for these people who are on the verge of converting, but who are hesitating to convert or fresh converts might, again, who have lost access to wealth. So I, I think that we don't need to shut it down completely and we have to open it up like some people want to do. And, and you said that there are uh, some Muslims who use the car for campaign funding to try to, uh, try to uh, bring the political parties and politicians uh, towards Bulma. Is that really, does that really happen? I mean, I've, I've never heard... Uh, that happening does that happen in the states sadly it happens yes it happens to you really? in the united states yeah so so money will be given to the democrats or or to the republicans from zakar from zakar money uh to try to reconcile them um towards islam yes wow okay um right and, and let's talk about fisa bilillah in the way of allah so um, this, you said, traditionally was understood to be uh, money that's given to uh, to fighters, to to those who are involved in, in jihad visabilillah. Now, of course, the word visabilillah today we use colloquially, at least in, in a very broad context. Um, are we able to broaden that category to, uh, I don't know, anyone who's working, a dawah organization who's doing some very good work uh, trying to bring the youth to the Qur'an or an Islamic society or an MSA that's in need of money uh, to propagate uh, the deen? Can we, or a university even that, uh, that specializes in Islamic studies, can we pay our zakah to those, uh, to those institutions? Yeah, so let's, let's take this term and understand it and then we can go through what folks have said uh, you know, and I say folks colloquially, like what just general people say and what scholars have said. So fi sabirullah, like literally, right? The word fi sabirullah means in the cause or in the cause of Allah, which was traditionally understood to mean in um, military campaigns. So to fund weapons, to fund fighters, right? To fund whatever is needed for the state to protect itself. That was the idea behind it. Uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he actually said that uh, hajj is also called a sabil, uh, sabirullah. So he actually allowed it to be used for the payment and, and uh, of, of people getting to perform hajj. So the majority of scholars, I'd say the vast, vast majority, limited it to things that had to do with physically protecting the ummah, as well as the minority said it could be used for these hajj purposes. A very, very small minority said that there was some wiggle room to use this for other good causes, uh, because linguistically, fi was not a restrictive term. Now, what's happened today in the absence of the state, again, and in the Western context where, again, Islam is weak, uh, is that a lot of scholars have come out, I should say sorry, a lot, some scholars have come out with the opinion that Sabirullah should be re-understood. It still means jihad, but it doesn't mean only physical jihad. So there's an intellectual jihad that, that is happening in the world today. So some of those scholars who are very reputable, respected scholars have said that we need to widen it a bit. 
So we should use this for the sake of intellectually defending Islam from the attacks that it's been uh, exposed to um, in order to preserve the iman of people and, of course, to spread you know, the, uh, Islam to others. So that's one kind of category of where it's been expanded. Now, and even that is debated amongst the scholars. Not everyone is on board with that. Uh, and the precedent, they say, is that, of course, protecting the hearts of Muslims, protecting their faith has always been a priority. But historically, other means were used to accomplish that. So there was the waqf system of endowments people had, and there was general sadaqat. And so that would be used for madaris and for schools and for the types of, 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 of intellectual means that were needed to serve the Muslims. Now we'll leave this for a minute and we'll say, so what has happened now? What well, people have taken this term now and said, well, if the door is opened a bit for, let's say, you know, good things, you know, like uh, intellectual jihad, well, Everything we're doing can be, you know, Fisa Bidullah means good things that we do. So we should be able to use it for, you know, MSA programs. And we should be able to use it for, um, you know, opening up an Islamic school for, for anybody. And we should be able to use it for anything that is a noble cause. And this is where I worry, again, that the masses, masses have taken this concept and actually destroyed it. Zakah becomes meaningless when it can be used however anybody wants to use it. I mean, the whole point is that it is a technical form of paying money from the wealthy that is supposed to be primarily given to the poor. And the Prophet said in the hadith, when he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, he says, take from the, their rich and give it to their poor. So once zakah becomes a tool that is being used by the upper middle class to fund their projects, which are they're very noble projects, the building of masajid, the building of schools, the building of Islamic centers, um, to, you know, to do dawah all over the place. But these are not, there's no precedent that this is how zakah was used historically. And my fear is that because Western Muslims see that there's less money available in the sadaqah pool, that they want to tap into the larger zakah pool. But my concern is that this is now transferring wealth from those who truly need it to those who are absolutely not, it's not, it's not their right to use it. So let's say, give this example. So we want to have an Islamic school in our neighborhood and Islamic schools in Western settings generally, right? You know, there's a high fee to operating them that, and they often serve a certain class of Muslims as well. That if zakat is being used to fund projects for the middle class and the upper middle class, it's almost like you're paying zakat to yourself or, or for the masjid. I want to build a masjid in my community and I use my zakat to build the masjid. Well, I'm the beneficiary of it. So one of the rules of zakat is not to be the beneficiary, the direct beneficiary. You can't pay zakat to yourself. And so when I give zakat to things that I benefit from first and foremost, that is a violation of that rule. So, I mean, to summarize all of this, if people were to take fi sabirullah as being this open category, then Allah would never have had to say zakat is for the poor and the needy, right? And the collectors and those hearts who are to be inclined and the, and the prisoners and the indebted. Allah should have just said, inna masadaqatu fi sabirillah. And the issue would have been resolved. So it goes back to the usul here, is that when Allah says something, is every word in the Quran have meaning? And does Allah put superfluous statements in the Quran that really have no value because he could have just replaced it with one word? And these are the type of things people have to think about. And I really think that we have to uh, tighten this up without shutting the door to it. But again, it's about transparency and scholarship. Define what you mean, put the conditions around what you mean and put those. And once it's been codified in this way, then perhaps we can consider that conversation. But just this open door policy of zakat can be used anywhere, anytime by anybody. This is an abuse that I believe is very, very dangerous and, and unlawful. Okay, that's, uh, that's uh, very, very interesting. And um uh, you've talked about zakah uh, has to be paid on unspent 